Managing director, raise your hand. One, two, three, four. Who is Mary Catherine? Okay, we talked about technicals and like Trevor said, it's going to be analyzing the price action of different stocks, which usually reflects the behavior of the institutions that are getting in and out of these stocks. And that's what triggers these certain technical signals. Um, we're only going to go over the most popular and well-known of the technicals. Um, there's hundreds and hundreds of different technicals you can look at. These are just the ones you'll hear about the most. Um, first of all, there is some debate as to how effective technicals are in the long term. Short-term results can be really good with technicals, um, but you don't see a lot of technicians, people that just trade off the technicals that are successful for decades. It's pretty hard to, use, to find one system that keeps working. It usually, um, usually kind of ferrets its way out and ends up um, not making money anymore. Uh, Co-founder of the Quantum Fund said he's never met, met a rich technician. And if you think of all of the best investors um, with Buffett and Soros and Ackman, they all use fundamentals. So. You don't see a lot of top investors using technicals. Um, there was a group, which you guys may have heard of, the Quants in 2008, the people that use algorithms and stuff. They were measuring deviation, which is kind of technical. It's more math-based, but they were highly successful until they helped cause the crash of 2008. So this kind of stuff ends up cannibalizing itself eventually. Um, and for a little bit of um, evidence of that, a study done by New Zealand's Massey University tested over 5,000 technical strategies. And then these technical strategies were tested in 49 different countries, and not a single one generated a return that's not consistent with chance. Um, so uh, they didn't really find one that proved anything at all. Um, however, with, with technicals and with it being a little bit shaky, it can be very useful for um, for timing the way you get into stocks. Although it may not be right for, it may not be good for making the reason for why you get into stock, but it may be great for when you decide to get into stock. When you picked out a stock, do you like the fundamentals? Um, you can look at the technicals to decide exactly when you might do that. This is the MACD, which is the moving average and Divergence and divergence. This is the one you'll hear about a lot. Uh, traders love moving averages. I, um, I've i tried trading with this. I'm not a huge fan of moving averages, mainly because they seem, they're very, very theoretical. Um, in that, you know, you, besides the fact that you've got other traders trading on moving averages, it's really not anything except a, just a number that's been calculated. Um, now, most of the time they take, um, they just take the different shorter and longer term moving averages and smooth it into lines. And you just look at where the lines converge and diverge. Um, this, like all technical, with <coughs> this one in particular is good for strongly trending markets. So if you've got a very well-defined bull market or bear market, this is when it's highly effective. If you've got a choppy market, this is not a very good technical indicator. You'll just get whipsawed back and forth. Lucas, have you got anything on any of this? Just question. No, I'll just read it. Uh, real quick, could you, could you describe what a moving average was that it consisted of? Yeah, the moving average is taken over a certain number of days, and you take the average price range of, over those days and lay it over across the line. So if it's a if it's a 20-day 20, 20 moving average, it takes the average of the uh, the close of every day and averages it into a line that trends the last 20 days as of today. Now, this is a variation of, of moving averages. It uses a moving average, but I found this one much more effective because it takes, um, it charts the average price of the stock, which is right here, and here's the standard deviations. So anytime it gets out to here, it's most likely going to come back here. So you can see it kind of has a tendency to trend back to the zero. I, um, I personally found this one to be highly useful, especially for 
entering trades because you don't um, you want to be very careful buying into a stock when it's gotten here. It's possible that it's breaking out, but there's also there's a strong likelihood like ability you'll be able to get in here at least, if not down here. So and if it's and if it's breaking out, um, you probably missed the boat already. Yeah, yeah. It's too late to get into it now. Yeah, this is the relative strength index. I know that Trevor likes to look at this one. One of the ones he looks at. Um, this one is similar um, to the Commodity Channel Index, but this one is a little bit easier to track. They use this especially for um, the big indexes like the S and P 500, Nasdaq, Dow. You, um, traders will look at the Relative Strength Index, um, especially for day traders. They'll look at it to see when they think the buying is coming in. It does it has a pretty good measure of showing when strong buying is starting to build up in a certain direction. Um, this is just, usually they use 14 days relative strength index, so they just average out four day, 14 days of um, price movement. All of this, and all of this is going to be, is obviously all available to you on the trade monster. So this is, um, this is going to be something all you have to do is go to the technical events on the trade monster and it'll actually describe all this for you. I Lucas has at least read a book about this. I've just looked at it on the website, so I don't actually I probably don't know as much as he knows about this. Um, one of the fundamental flaws in technicals though, I um, I've used I have used technicals before, however, technicals make you trade stock like you're buying and selling a stock ticker which you're not doing. You're buying and selling a company. And that makes a huge difference. It can make you get into something that's not fundamentally a good company. Um, it, I mean, once again, it's great for timing stocks, but trading off of technicals and that being your reason is extremely dangerous. You have a tendency to get into companies that are just not solid companies. Um, let's see. Also, yeah, if you're not analytical and you don't think well in abstract terms, technicals are not trade off fundamentals basis because you need to be able to think ab abstractly and calculate odds with what you're doing. Um, when you're using these, you want to go back in the history of the stock and see what has happened when these technicals have been triggered before. So that gives you a good idea if this technical signal has any sort of bearing on the movement of the stock. Um, and I mean, along with that, just make sure, make sure you're actually focusing on getting into the company and not just for the technical. Oh yeah, on the uh, on the RSI, for instance, that's very very useful for when your stock has been trading really nicely or it's going up or really going down, <clears throat> and you want to know when that movement's going to end. And the RSI will change first, often, very often. And one of the things you want to look for is when, uh, let's say you have a company and the price goes up, it goes down, then goes up higher, and the RSI goes up, goes down, and then it comes up, but it peaks lower. That's called a divergence between the RSI and the stock that you want to trade. And that sign of divergence, especially if it's in the above 70 or below 30, that's a major sign that it, you know, there may be a real difference here. Maybe a, a huge trend change is about to happen. So that's a very important part of using the RSI. Uh, I was talking with Dr. Mankin the other day about technicals and what he thought about them. And he brought up a very, very popular theory, especially in academia, about uh, technicals, which is random walk theory, which basically says the price fluctuates randomly around the stock's true value, which is driven by investors who really know what they're doing and are based on the fundamentals behind it. But the, beyond that, it has no predictive value, and you can't really use this. I would counter that, saying that the people who trade these stocks and the fundamentals, they do have a cycle. They do have something that drives them, and they react predictably over time, and that is represented in the price and the volume. So I think there really is something to technicals here, and I think there are a lot of very influential traders that would agree with that. I wouldn't do this solely by itself. That's a little bit like going into relationships just off of a 
appearances or something like that. It was a very show. Yeah. <laughs> not, a, not a good long-term policy, but it definitely helps in timing your, your entry. So it, it's worth getting to know really well, especially with RSI. Yeah. And along with timing your injuries, you need to think, when you're using these, you have to analyze what's happening in the broader market. Because, for instance, when I was looking, I have the energy sector, and I was looking for when I wanted to get into some of these oil stocks and we do the camera. We had this, we had the market slide for a couple of days. It killed the technical signals. And if you would have followed the technicals, you would have missed this massive rally we've had in energy. So if you see strong, if you see a strong downtrend in the you see a strong downtrend in for a couple of days, it has a tendency to kind of throw off the technicals. The technicals are more effective when it's not having just a massive, um, consistent fall. Okay. Uh, so we're talking about like the psychological facts of stocks, the market in general is a psychological mess. Uh, one of the main reasons why uh, the markets go up and down so violently lately. Um, is because people have access to trading like they never have before. Um, you used to have to call your broker after you got a newspaper, and it, by that time, it had already been two days, and the stock was back to where it was trading at uh, prior to when you know the violent swings happened in like the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. um, so, but now, uh, this is the blue line that's represented here is a 200-day moving average, and when the Ebola crisis started, the market started to drop. 200-day moving average is like a big, oh my gosh, something is really wrong if we go below this line. Now, this is for most indexes, and especially the S&P uh, 500. So if you're looking at this, uh, about 1905, was it? 1905 was the, was the support, um, is where this line was when it crossed below. Now, you see a big chunk. It, it, it went pretty far down, and people were really concerned about where we were going. Some people were going to say that it was going to be worse than 2008. So it's a very big scare factor, and a lot of people trade off of this. Like Lucas said, some people actually really believe that the market is solely, mostly bought and sold off of technicals. And some people say it's solely fundamentals. It doesn't matter. We're not here to debate that. We're here to take two differences and use them to our advantage to trade off of. So when you see something like this happen and we have a drastic drop, let's say this happens again. Let's say, let's say it goes below 1905 again. What would you do, Josh? I would sit and see the hold and support level. Okay. So one of the reasons why I told your MDs to keep at least seven and a half percent cash. This is a big reason why. Let's say all of your positions together pull back 10%. Okay, so you bought in at five, let's say it was, let's break even, okay, so you gain 5% and then the market pulls back 10. Can somebody give me the math on that? You lose how many percent overall? 10 minus 5 is 5%. But guess what, now you have 7.5% in cash, $7,500, so that you can reinvest at a bottom of when you think the market is done acting like a little girl. You keep cash so that if the market does bottom out, you have the ability to cover how much the market dipped. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes? It's, it's, it's to take this into consideration. It's not like, it's, it would be like saying you're going to go and buy a car when you only make $200 a month. It's not really feasible, is it? The car, the value of the car goes down and you only make 200 bucks and you, let's say the car payment is 195 You have five bucks. What happens if the car, you get in an accident? Well, you're screwed. Right? Um, so these are big technical indicators. So we went over some things, and I know it was a lot. So start asking questions. What do you not understand? Everybody, so if, if I gave out a quiz, everybody would get it right. I know there's questions. Can you get RCI on the oil stock? Wait, 
Where are you going, Anne? Okay, so um, RSI, I use a lot. It's an indicator of where the stock's momentum is, basically. It's the strength of how many people are pushing through to try to get as many buys, or if it's if the resistance or RSI is going down, that means if it, if it goes down sharply, that means a whole bunch of people are selling the stock. And that means it's getting bombarded by big chunks of volume. And it's losing strength. But if you have a company like Apple, Apple is at trading at what today? 105 ish. 105 ish. Thank you, tech sector. 105 105 ish. Um, it, was, and, uh, it doesn't matter. It's 105, 20 something, I think. Um, but in this, the reason why it has been doing so well correlates back to the relative strength. The company has posted good projections for the next couple of years, a little weak on the iPad 2 sales. But in the long term, people are saying, okay, this, this company is going to make a crap load of cash. And people are starting to say, you know what, we're going to push this stock a little bit higher. And the RSI is an indicator of how consistently it's being pushed up by investors. Okay? So we trade off of fundamentals, which then turns into a technical pattern. Our action of buying an Apple, one share of Apple, goes into pushing the stock price higher, or if we sell it, it goes into pushing the stock lower. So we are a catalyst for affecting a technical indicator. But we can also view historical patterns of how the stock trades psychology that history always repeats itself, right? If you look at the trending chart since like the 1920s, the market has gone like this. It'll go up, drop down a little bit, Go up, drop down a little bit, go up, drop down a lot, and then go even higher. We are, the, the economy is, is always growing, whether it's because the government won't get their nose out of our business, or whether it's because we're creating new products. We're always growing. We're becoming more efficient. So, using technical indicators are a big, useful tool that if you learn how to use them correctly, um, and I'm not sure on the meeting time, we're probably going to have to postpone it two weeks from now. Um, but James McMurray, um, a teammate's uh, father, we, we started getting on the topics of investing. This guy day trades $7 million a day based on this. He created a mathematical formula to predict when the market moves. He either makes $40,000 or $10,000, or he loses $40,000, or loses $10,000. But he has a 70% win rate. So do the math. 70% of the size, 7 out of 10 times, he will either make 40 or make 10. And 3 out of those 10 times, even, let's say, let's say even if he, uh, he loses 120 grand, he's still making 70 grand. That's a bad day. That's the worst day he could have. Pretty dang impressive. And he'll, he'll be coming in, not this upcoming week, because we probably won't have a meeting next week. I'll probably ask you guys to meet with your MDs and just do um, some research and, and kind of look at where you guys are standing. Um, but any other questions? Can you talk about the technical? What, what does that mean? Technical? Okay, technical has to do with the more psychological patterns of the way that the stock is trading. Okay? So you're seeing, you're seeing these lines, right? Right here, right here, right here. There, there are there are people that think that you can track. It's like it's like looking at at, at history. You look at history and you say, okay, the, the economy always collapses every once in a while, or there's always a bubble, or there's always something that's gonna explode, or something that bad that's gonna happen. You can't just keep going up and up and up and up, right? Because in history, we learn that. You know, bad events happen and you know that causes you know X to happen. So you using technicals are predicting what you think is gonna happen to a stock. Okay? So like if we go back to moving averages, okay, a lot of people use the twenty was it the twenty and the five and the two hundred and the fifty and the five and the two, I think. 
but yeah, those are all things. Yeah, okay, so. To, uh, let's do Apple. Okay? Everybody loves Apple. Alright, so I'm looking at a 50 day, 50 day moving average, okay? So this is telling me over the last 50 days, this has been the average price. So as the stock price has gone up, this is starting to go up, right? But to your point, Ming, the technical pattern of this is saying that because the stock price is above this line, you have, you're have you okay until it goes below this line. And once it goes below this line, we have things called support levels that we'll get into on a different meeting. But once you start breaking through this, this is your main level of support. Think about it as the ground on your feet, okay? You can jump up in the air and you can bounce all you want, but unless you go through the floor, you're not in trouble, right? It's the same thing with the stock. Until you get through this, you know, you're okay. So it can it can you know trend up here, blah 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 blah. You see where this it goes above right here? And then as soon as it hits this point, it drops pretty good, right? And then it bounces back up. Does that I mean does that make sense? Like if I jump up in the air, like imagine this. Me jumping up in the air. I jump two feet off the ground. If I land here and I bounce back up, it's okay. But if I fall through the floor, I don't know where I'm going. Okay? Yeah. You said if we're going if we're going below the line, we are in trouble. What kind of trouble do you are you talking okay, about? Okay, so oh man, I wish we had a class for that. Um <clears throat> you're in trouble on a technical standpoint. So the, the, the psychological patterns that have happened in the past, uh, people will trade specifically off of that line. So instead of looking at Apple and what they do, they will literally go like this. Oh, we went below the line, sell. Yeah, but if somebody sells, somebody buys. So the level is insane. I don't understand how if somebody But there, sells. Are, there, are, there are people who sell way more than people are willing to buy. So if nobody is buying, you can't sell to nobody. Like somebody have, has to buy it. It's, it, it's all on the price. It depends on how bad they want, how bad they want to get rid of you. Like I, yeah. I, I really want to get out. I really, I guess I'll give you a really, really good price okay. on something. Okay. That's, that's that's it. Okay. Yeah. So if, if you need ten thousand dollars to sell your car, mm -hmm. but you know that nobody's gonna buy it, nobody's gonna so buy it, you're gonna lower the price. Buy. Okay. Exactly. Yes. Got it. I think I think one of the best examples of what support is is this. Right here, John Deere, um, big institutions buy into this. Um, if you look at this chart, you can see it kind of pop up, and when it comes down, it holds here, it bites a little bit, and it comes back up. It always but it stays consistent. Level. It always holds right here. This is where it supports that, and that's because in, in the past, and there's probably still orders sitting there, institutions think every time it's getting to 80, it's a fantastic deal. So they have they have bids sitting there. So any time there's a panic, anybody tries to sell into it, they just hold that line because they know the company's worth more than that. For instance, Warren Buffett is a huge, is a big owner in this stock. And as there's going to be, obviously since he's so big, he can't buy into like this because he'll move the stock price up too fast because he's buying too many shares. He needs to wait until there's a time like this when everybody wants to sell, and that's when he can get all the shares he wants at that time. So the support level is just where it is always held, usually, which in turn can turn into resistance. If it breaks through, like for instance, the support was here, but you see it break through, and then when it came back to the previous support level, it had some difficulty breaking through for a little while before it finally um, went back above it, because now there's people who bought in there who want to sell to get back to their even. They all bought at the support level thinking, oh, it's going to hit it, it'll go back up. Well, they're all they're all at pulling paper losses right now. So when it gets back to that level, they say, "I'll sell it. I'll just cover my losses on it." Um, so the support is just where it is always going to hold. Just like Trevor said, it's just it's just the floor. Support and resistance you can see pretty easily in charts because it's just where there's basically just straight lines across the chart. That's all you're basically looking for um, for for support. So so think about it this way, guys. We'll put everything in. Terms. 
the reason why I I ask your managing directors to keep cash is why. So if there's a discount, if there's a sale at a store, you've got money in your pocket to go buy something that somebody else doesn't have money to buy. Okay? If there's a huge market pullback and everybody is like, oh my gosh, I have to sell, they're selling at a loss, right? But guess what? Them selling forces the price to go even lower. And if more selling, it goes even lower and lower and lower. But guess what? You have in cash, say, guess what? Everybody sold, I can buy it at a penny. Because everybody thinks it's a bad thing when we all know that markets usually, uh, well, as far as history is concerned, markets always go up. That, yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's put this in gambling perspective. Everybody loves to gamble. Daniel loves scratchers. He's very bad about it. Okay, so let's say you buy a $5 lotto ticket, like a scratcher card, right? And you get $10. You win a $10 thing. You can either do one of two things, or one of three things, actually. You can keep your $10, right? Or... Option number two, you can buy another lotto ticket for $5, and you can keep $5 in your pocket, right? And so the value of your $5 has gone to buying another lotto ticket. Or number two, you can be ballsy like Daniel, and you can buy two lotto tickets again and then lose. Now, that doesn't hypothetically happen in the stock market, but it's that same concept. If the market goes up 10%, if you sell half of your position in every stock because you say, okay... I think that I can hold on. I, you know, this is this is why it's very key to have exit points before you get into a stock. Okay, if Apple, I, I told my brother, I said eighty nine dollars for Apple is too cheap. I said buy it. I said get out at one oh five. I think that's pretty pretty steady. He got out today. Why? Because he made sixteen dollars a share. Sixteen dollars a share. He can't be greedy. Okay, we can't all be greedy. Because stocks get expensive, right? So the point of en or exit is based on you and your managing director's discretion. If you think that a stock can go up $2 per share, sell it when it goes to $2 per share. Get your profit and get out. Because if you go past that, you're never going to have a ceiling. And then what happens when the stock goes up maybe to $4 and you're like, oh, yeah, it's going to keep going. And guess what? The stock market crashes. And you could have gotten out at $2 and had cash, but instead now you're sitting at like a 10% loss. Does that make sense? Okay. This And this is an example. This is an example of when you need to choose to get out of stock. This was one of my very first trades. I bought into the stock here, and I thought it was worth about this. But it came to here, and I thought, you know, I'll sit around, and it started doing this, and I kept sitting. And then it started going like this. I sold out here because I just knew it was getting absurd. Like, I knew that the stock clearly wasn't valued that much. I knew there was a big, um, big buying coming in because everybody had been short. They would sold the uh, stock short and needed to cover. But I knew this is a 3D printing stock. I knew it wasn't worth more than this, so I sold out here. And it went up to here, and I got to watch it after I'd sold. I got to watch it tied up another 4 or $5 and feel like I was an idiot for selling out. And then... It did this, and it went straight down. And now I could have tried to hold on for the last two dollars, but if I had done that, I might have ended up selling down at the bottom again. So when you get in a stock and it gets to a point where you know it's not worth that, you just need to get out. It doesn't matter what's going on with the stock; you just need to get out. Sure. Well, one thing that uh, a lot of traders do is when they're when they're going out, they have different price objectives, and they sell not everything at once per se, but hey, at this point. I'm going to get out about 50% of my share, yeah. another 25%. And then I, I scale out as I go. And it depends on how big your uh, transaction costs are. The higher those are, the less you want to mess with it. But if those aren't a big problem, you, you want to try to scale out a position. So you do squeeze out that movement. But you don't have a big loss if it goes right back down. Yeah. Um, so uh, the technicalities you know, when we had uh, Mr. Chang in here, um, I'll, I'll be honest with all of you, I've been honest with a couple of you, but I thought that when he came up here and said, 
Yes, I see one problem. Uh, your presentation is very good. I agree with all of it. And I sat there and I, I was like, oh my gosh, I thought I was going to get chewed out for a second. I thought he was going to say, oh, your model is complete crap, but he agreed with me. So fundamentals, technicals, and overview. We're at technicals right now. There are three things, which means that each thing, if you weight it evenly, is what? 33%, right? This will not make or break your portfolio. This will not, you know, it could turn you into some genius or some rich person, but it can also make you a very poor person if you do not do it correctly. Um, so with this looking forward, um, fundamentals, looking at how, how cheap a stock is. If, if a stock, you know, is trading way down here and you know it's worth way right, like about here, buy the stock. People are going to start to notice it. It's cheap. Um, I uh, I bought Sprint at a dollar eighty seven. It's been a while since I've looked at this, and I don't like looking at it. But uh, oh. wow, yeah, like down here somewhere. Um, so Sprint came out all the hype was like, yeah, Sprint is so cool. It's like T Bumble. Yeah, okay. Well, so I bought in like right here, right? And it went up and I probably made, I don't know, like this is embarrassing, but like maybe 75 cents a share. It was it was a bad trade. I it wasn't bad enough that I lost money, but I didn't make a lot of money. And I could have held it here. And I would have been in great shape. And it went down. My par value for Sprint was six dollars. Um, and maybe it was yeah, five twenty-five, I think, around there. And I got out at like uh, around six dollars. And I saw it go to seven dollars. It was the same thing that happened to Josh. And I was like, Oh, I could have made so much more money. I'm so dumb. And stock went back down to what I thought it was worth around six dollars. You put a price tag on something, you're not going to go to the store, let's say you go to the store, you're going to some outlet store, and you want to buy a jacket because it's getting cold outside, right? And you have eighty dollars in your pocket, and you go to a store and you see a jacket for eighty dollars, and you know it's not worth that. Are you going to pay eighty dollars for that jacket? You know it's not worth $80. It's probably worth $40. You gonna buy it? You're gonna keep shopping. Do the exact same thing with stocks. Put it into perspectives of you buying and selling things that you do. It's the exact same thing. It is the exact same thing. What sector are you in? What sector are you in? Tech. Tech. Perfect example. God, that's so nice. If you're going to go buy an iPhone, you're not going to go pay $1,000 for it. Well, some people do. It's idiotic. But some people will overpay. Are you going to overpay? No, because we're college students. We're poor. We're, we always look for the best bargain. That is exactly what you do here. You look for the best bargain until you buy. Yeah? Uh, how do you know how much the stock is worth? How That's the DCF. Were you here last week? Yes. So the, the valuation, yeah. the discounted cash flow that we did, okay. okay, that's what we take the basis of the value of the stock off of. Okay, so um, this is going to be outrageous. Most of you are going to want to want to go buy Apple after I show you this, which I mean, you can do. I don't really care. But you want to flip that light on, please, Mark? Trevor, I think we should run the discounted cash flow with Tesla. No, that's the way to value that company. Okay. So. All right. So Grayson. Yes. You can say your question. 
But who was here when we looked at Tesla the other week? Oh, I want to compare something really quick. Janet, go ahead. Well, if you saw that, then why did you tell your brother to sell it on the spot? Because that's what I think it's worth. Why because do I think it's worth only one? And, and here's the thing, you you have to be you have to be. It's what it's worth to you. If you have all Apple products and you're an Apple fiend and you put an Apple sticker on yeah. the back of your car, you're gonna think that Apple's gonna be worth a more than $105 a share. Yeah, exactly. So, how, what do we do with that? It's it's what it, it's your discretion. Because if there are more people like you than me, then the stock's gonna go way higher than $105. Right? Yeah, but See, the problem so you could have you could have made more money. Huh? You could have made more because more people are gonna buy it. I could have made more. But but like I said, it's risk reward. Are you risking more or are you allowing yourself to take profits and say I can invest it in something that's cheaper? You've already made my brother's already made sixteen yes, dollars yeah. a share. If he takes his money out and puts it in something else that's way cheaper than Apple, he's gonna make more money. He can only make so much more with Apple. There's a ceiling somewhere because people exaggerate the price way too much. Now, I do think Apple is way undervalued, but they also give great dividends. Uh, you know, they give out, I mean, they're looking at a huge buyback that Carl Icahn can't shut his mouth about. Um, yeah, Shannon? Are you raising your hand? No. Okay. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> technically, if you, add, if you add the tangible book value, it gets a little bit. So last week, uh, Mr. Chang talked about the dream. Apple was sitting at this at one point. And that's why there's a third concept that is almost as important, if not more important, than fundamentals and technicals. And that's the overview. How do you, as a consumer, view the investment? Tesla, to me, it's not worth negative twelve dollars and twenty four cents. If that was the case, I wouldn't be going on national television and preaching about it next week. Right? They have a dream. It's expensive because it's trading at. I can't even look at that. It's trading at way way more expensive. I just when I look at that, I. I uh, um. But. I'm not the only one who feels this way. Tesla has an amazing concept. They're building very quickly, but they are also spending a lot of money. They're spending a lot of money on creating something that is going to make their dream even bigger. And that's one of the reasons when you look into a stock and you look at their overview, and then you look at their fundamentals, what are they spending money on? If you look at Tesla's balance sheet, almost all of their money has not gone into, oh, I'm going to buy... Uh, Brian's watch at $9 and then sell it for $11 and make a measly profit. It's, I'm going to take $10 out of Brian's po pocket, I'm going to build something, and then I'm going to sell it for $100,000. That's what they're trying to do. They've taken all the money that they've taken out of debt and out of their equity, and they're putting it straight into research and development and manufacturing things and making tangible value investments. That's the difference that I see. So, you know, you sit here and you're like, okay, well, what are they worth? What does it worth to you? The market shows that, okay, this may be wrong, but the dream, that's a fundamental aspect. How much is that dream? People in the marketplace think this is what it should be worth. If you think that same thing, I think this price, okay, what did I tell you over the summer? Price started like 400 or something like that? Yeah. I had an analyst call me over the summer and say, we have a price target on Tesla for $400. And I was like, wow, that's pretty, that's pretty tasty. Because at the time, I had bought into Tesla at $189. Pretty, pretty nice, right? So I, at the time, I think it was like 220 230 It was around this, this level. Yeah. Um, Guess what happened? I was like, oh yeah, it's going to 400. And then Elon Musk, the CEO, said, uh, I do not think that the uh, 
stock is short this much. And then we got a gut check, and then it just went all the way down. So even the, even the CEO says, okay, I think the hype is too much. I think that people are overvaluing our company. And if the CEO thinks that, you're sitting there looking at it like, okay, that's probably right. Right? Yeah. Did he publicly announce that? Yes, he did. What it was that? literally in the morning. <laughs> Who does that? It, <laughs> trust me, I, I called him, and I was, and, and I, him, I think. And I literally, I think I threw my remote at the wall. I was so mad. I was, I was not happy. So um, we've got about 14 minutes, because I would like to try to keep your Friday night still intact. Um, questions? Throw me curveballs. Throw me fastballs. Watch me swing and miss strike three. Question. Yeah. Where did you see their balance sheet? Yeah, so balance sheet, um, you can actually, can you get it on Uber or uh, Trade Monster? Uh, no. Okay. For everybody's information, sec.gov. Just like this website, you can search any balance sheet, income statement, or cash flow within somebody's 10K, which is their reporting. So if you were to type in Apple, it shows up, the filings. On there, you're looking for 10Ks. Okay, so you go through here, and you're going to see. Okay. Yeah. Or you can go on Guru Focus, and you can look at 10-year financials. And this is a neat. Uh, Everybody, get on their computer real quick and go on Guru Focus. Pick a stock that you have in your sector. Look up um, J and J. So, Trevor, did you lose a lot uh, by selling uh, Tesla? I haven't sold Tesla. Okay. So. Yeah. Because here's how I see it: it's at 189. I bought that at 189. It's trading at 235, but it's also gone to 290. I think it could go. I'm my my out point is 250. Select a metric per share. You can see what you can see trends. Here's the earnings per share. You can see what the earnings per share for the last couple of years have done. That makes it really easy to compare um, uh, how different things are going, how the dividends been changing, anything like that. And that makes it easy. That way, once you go back through it and go across the columns, you can just click and see whatever metric you want to use to analyze. Yeah, so put it put it to you this way. If you took I don't, I don't know if you if you have one of these people, but somebody who's extremely wealthy in your family gives you a lot of money uh, to take care of, not to do anything stupid with. That's the mentality that we're taking on. Because we want to show people that we can make good, not risky, but conservative growth over the next six to seven months until uh, the summertime, and I'm going to take that and be like, hey, let's get an endowment fund for this. And um, I was at a board meeting with the College of Business. Uh, David Costello, who's the head or was the um, ex-president and CEO of NASBA, 
which is the Na National Accounting Society or something. It's like the biggest accounting um, group in the, in the United States. Um, and uh, the CEO and president of the Avenue Bank, and um, they were really interested in this. So if we can have a positive output and really show that we can maturely trade and invest in things, I think that it's something that we could um, definitely do um, next year. So this is kind of like our trial run. Can, do we have the skills? Do you guys have the ability to make sound, smart, unstupid investment decisions? It's really not. Would you buy Apple right now? Of course, because in 10 years, it's going to be worth way more than a dollar and five shares. I'm um, sorry, I was thinking about my golf swing and how bad it was to me. Um, uh, so, but uh, take take this into consideration. Like you're trading, literally put yourself into shoes where you are trading for somebody. Okay? I'm doing this on a daily basis with more than $500 million in the last four weeks, and it's probably been the most stressful it has been for me in a long time because I've never handled this much money and uh, I've never had to do this much work in my entire life. But it's a little different where you guys are at right now. You guys can learn a lot over this next seven to six to seven months and you guys can work moderately hard at this and get a lot out of it by next year because you'll have the entire summer to just be like, hey, I'm going to free trade, I'm going to test this out even more. And then when we come back, if we have money, you guys, are, you guys are home free actually trading people's money. You know how good that's going to look on some of your guys' resumes? All of your guys' resumes? This is pushing pushing not just so we can leave a legacy behind. This is pushing you for your individual growth and something that you can say, I've been a part of that I helped build. Um, so you've got seven minutes. If your managing director is here, which Mary Catherine is not, um, Ming, who did I put you in? Who, who was your roommate? Huh? Yeah, I think it was I didn't, but yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so you're with me tonight, Shanna, and who was Lorena's? I was there. Okay, so you're with me as well, and who was with Lorena? Mary Catherine. I think, I think, oh, Catherine was, yeah, and she's not here. Her grandpa is in the hospital. Um, okay, so spend, like, the next five to ten minutes just meeting with your managing director. Um, go over some investments. Talk about this stuff because we want to push you guys to do amazing things in the future. Three takeaways from the technicals. Things you got to go. Write down, look these up later. Would be... Look up support and resistance. Support and resistance. Trend analysis, trend line analysis, which works a lot like support and resistance. And the moving averages. I would look those up. I would get to know if those will help with your fundamental analysis too. Trend line what? Analysis. Trend analysis, trend line analysis. So, Bede, you're with me. Grayson, you're with. Uh, Daniel, what was that last one? Uh, moving averages. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, just you want to leave him for me, though. You want to no, just work with him tonight, and then yeah. Brian yeah. actually, um, or Shanna and um, Miriam go with um, Joshua. Um, yeah, Mir Miriam and Shanna go with Lucas. No. Well, do we want? Oh, did I? I mean, 
I kind of we talked about this. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So, Beach Beach is gonna be with you. Okay. Um, and so yeah, Shanna and Miriam. Initially, yeah, he wants to be. He wants to be here. He okay. looked at the last video, and I've been a little in material with him. So yeah, he knows the stuff. But he, yeah, I don't know. Okay. Um, and then, never. Oh, okay. All right. If you're with me, we'll come over this way. <laughs>